Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating system engineer at Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days, and I wrote the Windows Disk Formatter that we've all been using for the last 25 years or so. And today, I'll tell you the secret history of Windows Format. This is the actual memory card that I used to write and test Windows Format back in the day on the Windows Shell team. What's on it? I don't know, I haven't looked, I'm a busy man. But it was huge for its day, coming in at 16 megabytes of rated capacity. That's enough to hold two copies of the ebook for Stephen King's The Stand. No joke, I looked it up, it's like 7.7 megabytes. And this is a 256 gigabyte micro SD card. Super handy for dash cams, drones, security cameras and more, but if you want to format the whole thing under Windows, you can't. Do you know why you can't? Because I said so. Yeah, that's how my kids look at me when I say stuff like that too, but it's literally true in this case, and that's today's story. I was working on porting the Windows 95 shell over to Windows NT and making it run on MIPS, Alpha, PowerPC, and so on. I guess because I had worked on Smart Drive and other block-level device stuff before, I was tasked with writing the new Windows format. In this case, it had to be a replacement and a complete rewrite since the Windows 95 system was so markedly different. We had multiple file systems and compression and encryption and we allowed you to vary the geometry and so on. There was no real equivalent in Win95. Now I didn't write the device code, the parts down in the driver and the file system that do the actual zeroing of the bits on the media, but rather the part that the user interacts with to set up how the format will be organized. What file system do you use, how big, the geometry in terms of clusters and sectors and tracks and so on. And up at the very top of that software stack sits the actual Windows dialog that the user sees. It's only a tiny fraction of what I call the UI, and I wrote that part as well as everything else all the way down to the API level. I think I wrote that dialogue on a rainy Tuesday morning between 9am and 10am, which is my way of saying that I didn't spend a lot of time on the actual layout of the user interface because I'm not a user interface designer by trade. We had very talented people, including Joe Belfiore's entire Win95 design team that did such work, and other than Task Manager and a few other things, I largely stayed in my own lane when it came to design work. Plus, if I had my way, everything would look like Visual Studio anyway, or so I've been told by those who should know. This is the interior for my Range Rover. I've kept the old boy at least 10 years, in part because I like the user interface more than the newest ones. This old one is entirely hard buttons. The LCD display provides info and feedback and runs the infotainment, but everything about the physical device itself is located on a hard button or switch or knob, and that's the way I like it. If you've ever fumbled for the hazard switch on a rental car, then you can imagine how much worse it would be if you had to navigate through the vehicle and safety menus first to get there. And that's why every hazard button is a hard button in every car by federal law. That's part of the reason why my wife's Tesla can be a little frustrating to me. With hard buttons, you know what selections are available to you, whereas with a dynamic user interface like the Tesla, clicking on a button might not actually do anything more than show you five more buttons that you could click on. Which is why Format is basically a vertical stack of buttons and drop-downs that shows all your decision points on screen at one time in a single window. It's not fancy and it's not elegant, but it's all there for all the world to see, including the hypothetical designer who should be along at any moment now to design a beautiful and functional user interface for Windows Format. At that point, on sheer nostalgia alone, you'd imagine that Microsoft would want to get the band back together so badly that they would just back a truck of cash up to my house in order to get me to come out of retirement and actually code their new dream user interface for Format. But since I've been sitting on the front steps waiting for that to happen for about 20 years to no avail, let's just assume it won't be happening and that format will stay largely as it is for the foreseeable future. It's not pretty, but it gets the job done, mostly. Except when it comes to FAT32. And to explain why that is, it helps if you know a little bit about what it means to format a disk and why we do it. It's not simply erasing the disk by any stretch. As you might know, there are really two steps required to prepare a disk or a memory card for first use. First, you partition it, and then you format that partition. Partitioning is the process of breaking a big disk up into smaller volumes. For our sake, though, we'll just keep the conversation simple and assume that every disk is partitioned into one big volume. Then we just have to format that one volume. That's what most people do with removable media anyway. Formatting is the process of laying out the structure and geometry of the disk. It logically, and in some ancient cases, magnetically, carves the disk up into tracks and cylinders and sectors and so on. In the olden days, you even had to know how many tracks, like an old LP record, were actually on the disk, and how many heads they had, and how they were split up into sectors, and so on. Today, you just find out how many sectors are in a partition, and that's largely it. The drive hides or abstracts away the physical reality, and you just deal with a bunch of sectors. The FAT32 file system keeps track of the disk in clusters, and it keeps track of which file is using which cluster, and so on. To number all of these, it organizes the bytes on the disk into 512-byte sectors, which are then grouped into clusters. 
The trick is that no matter how big the disk is, you can never have more than 4,177,918 clusters on a disk. We won't get into the technical reasons of why, but that limit is fixed forever for FAT32. So if you divide a disk up into 4 million clusters, the bigger the disk, the bigger each cluster has to be. And hence, clusters are actually groups of bytes, up to 32K in size. And that's the problem. It's called cluster slack, and it's wasted space, and FAT32 is bad for it. Why? Because regardless of the file size of your file, it has to go on the disk as a list of clusters, and so the size is always rounded up to at least a full cluster size. That means even if you have just a tiny file that says hello world and you put it on a FAT32 disk with 32k clusters, instead of 12 bytes, it will take up a whole cluster of 32,768 bytes, which is a waste ratio of more than like 99.9% .9 of your disk. And this happens for every file, no matter its size, so the amount of waste of space can add up very quickly with large clusters, particularly with lots of small files. We call it cluster slack, and it's the unavoidable waste of space using FAT32 on large volumes. So how large is too large? At what point do you say, no, no, it's too inefficient, it would be folly, I can't let you do that. That's the decision I was faced with back on that rainy Tuesday morning. There's a famous apocryphal story wherein Bill Gates is quoted as saying that 640k would be as much memory as anybody would ever need. Unfortunately, cute though it is, it isn't actually true as he's never said that. Besides, 640k wasn't a limited bill pick, it was a technical reality imposed on them by the Intel architecture. But the FAT32 decision wasn't like that. You could, in theory, create a FAT32 disk of enormous proportions, terabytes in fact, but the cluster slack would be so enormous that it would waste gobs of space. I imagine my thought process went something like this. The memory card that I was using for testing, you might recall, was 16 megs. That was the largest I could get my hands on. Perhaps I multiplied that size by a thousand and then doubled it again for good measure and figured that'll more than suffice for the lifetime of NT 4.0. I picked the number 32 gig as the limit and went on with my day. I didn't start to regret that choice until SD cards got to the magic 32 gig size many years later and they started to bite me as well. Until now, I haven't explicitly stated that I thought I was only picking the limits for NT 4.0 and only until the designers revised and completed the UI. In other words, I thought my work and my decisions were somewhat temporary. That, however, is a fatal mistake on my part that no one should really be excused for making. With the perfect being the enemy of the good, good enough has persisted for 25 years and no one seems to have made any substantial changes to format since then. Some have speculated that restricting the FAT32 file system was a sinister plot to promote the adoption of NTFS. That's silly for a couple of reasons, not the least of which being that every system has to be NTFS anyway now, so there's no shortage of NTFS penetration. It's already on every system on the boot drive. Furthermore, NTFS isn't always appropriate for removable media of all types, so Microsoft had to include FAT32 support for some types of disks, whether they liked it or not. As far as I've ever seen, they never promoted or licensed NTFS to consumer electronics makers. As an example, you wouldn't want to format your floppy disk NTFS because it's very wasteful on small volumes, just like FAT is wasteful on big volumes. So there's a trade-off somewhere in there where it's at that point you just say, look, you really should be using NTFS for something this large. And I could see that limit being 32, but it was really more about where FAT became unwieldy and too wasteful. A more believable scenario, except one that I can also assure you did not factor into my decisions, was the future release of EXFAT, which can accommodate enormous disks. In fact, EXFAT can support disks up to 64 zettabytes in size with 32 megabyte clusters. Now imagine that. The cluster slack on a simple tiny readme.txt file would be more than twice the size of the disk that I used to write format in the first place. So you can imagine the numbers of that scale would have been a little hard for me to foresee as reasonable back then. With EXFAT you still face the issue of egregious cluster slack, but it really depends on what you're using the SD card for. I suppose I imagine that you might be storing thousands of songs and wasting many megabytes thousands of times is just wrong, because what else would you do with an SD card? But if you're recording long segments of 4K video, you might only have a small handful of files on the card, and so the cluster slack really is not an issue then. In the days of 16 meg cards, I didn't really anticipate a need for files quite of that size. NTFS supports a wide range of features that FAT does not, but if you don't need those features and you're just building a video camera or similar, then EXFAT is probably the way to go. The only downside is that Microsoft opted to license it and keep the source private. They licensed the spec to independent software and hardware vendors for use in their own products. I don't know the pricing details, but I suspect it's not cheap since it's aimed at companies like Sony and JVC and not mom and pop shareware vendors. I've heard like 300k, but that could be old news. So where does that all leave you if you have a large memory card and your device doesn't support EXFAT? Are you really limited to 32 gig in size? Well, using the built-in dialog, yes. But thankfully, there are two easy ways around it. The first is to just use the command line, which allows you to specify geometry in excess of what the shell dialog allows, so you can make a disk as big and inefficient as you'd like, subject to the FAT32 theoretical limits. 
The second alternative is to download a utility like Rufus or FAT32 format that bypasses the shell dialog and calls the file system APIs directly, just like the command line tool, so they're not hampered by such limits. At the end of the day, it was a simple lack of foresight combined with the age-old problem of the temporary solution becoming de facto permanent. I don't honestly know why they haven't over the years expanded the limits right in the shell dialog. I know I've suggested as much to the right folks. It could be a way of ensuring that the fat cash from the EXFAT licensing gravy train keeps on a flowing, but I highly doubt that. If it were me, and it used to be me, I'd be pretty scared of suddenly allowing people to create disks of a size that have never really been tested in more than two decades of consumer electronics. Because somewhere out there is a camcorder that bricks or erases your wedding video when you put in a 64 gig fat disk, and nobody wants those phone calls, especially when the win is so small and a well-tested solution exists in the form of EXFAT already. Do I wish it were free? Sure, but I wish a lot of things were free that aren't. But in this case, wishes do sometimes come true, because in the last year, Microsoft has opened up the spec for EXFAT and officially supports the addition of EXFAT drivers for the Linux kernel. How that affects the licensed version, I don't know, but an official open source version really can't be far away at this point. So there you have it. The problem, the how, the why, the workaround, the solution, and the future. All wrapped up in about uh, 11 minutes. If you like these little anecdotes about ancient Windows history and why things are the way they are, be sure to check out my Windows War Stories playlist on the channel and do consider subscribing to Dave's Garage so that you get notified of future episodes. I'm not selling anything and I don't have any Patreons, I'm just in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go. Thanks for joining me here today in Dave's Garage. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time. This little chair will be waiting for one of you. And a rocking chair for another who likes to rock. And a big armchair for two more to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage.